Okay, welcome back to the Neuroethics Learning Collaborative. Um, the lecture we're about to hear by Autumn Feaster is on human and animal research subjects. So I give you Autumn. Hi, good to be back. So tonight we're going to look at two different topics, uh, the use of human subjects in research and the use of animal subjects, let's say, in research. And um, first, going to start with human subjects research. We're going to look at both the history of human subjects research, just a very brief overview, and then we'll look at some of the main concepts in the area. So I'm going to take you through the Nuremberg Code, Helsinki, the Belmont Report, and I'm going to end up with the Common Rule, which is the set of regulations that govern human subjects research today in the United States. And then I'm going to look at four concepts, informed consent, undue inducements, the therapeutic misconception, and what's getting a lot of airtime now, the conflict of interest. Let's look at the history just very briefly. So as you know, um, the, some of the big issues in human subjects research came into the public's view and the profession's view, the, the view of medical researchers through the atrocities of the Second World War and the research that was done in Germany but also um, instigated or, or promoted from the Japanese. So coming out of the Second World War when the Nuremberg trials were going on, part of the judgment in the, of the trial was a set of regulations, not regulations, a set of principles or guidelines that were part of the judgment at Nuremberg. So in 1948, some of the guiding principles that would take us all the way through the rest of the 20th and into the 21st century were generated primarily by one particular physician. But what, what came out as the dominant principle from Nuremberg was that there had to be a voluntary consent and that no research could happen without consent. Because, of course, what had happened with the German and the Japanese experiments was that prisoners were used, prisoners who were later killed, and certainly prisoners that were um, not only treated very badly, but pretty much tortured through this medical research. So consent becomes the um, paramount condition or criterion for, um, for permissible or legitimate research. It was not binding. It was part of a judgment. Uh, it didn't become part of German or US law. But it led to a series of developments that happened as the history of human subjects research moved forward. And the next big moment was the Helsinki Code. So there's an organization called the World Medical Organization. And in their 18th meeting, they ratified this code, 1964. It's been modified multiple times. I think it's gone through five or six revisions since. And more detailed conclusions were reached from Helsinki, and I've listed them here, that research with human beings should be based on the results from laboratory and animal experimentation. In other words, we shouldn't have a hypothesis that's going to involve any type of, of invasive or, or possibly risky procedures involving human beings until there was already work done in laboratory and animal research. We're going to hear at the end of the talk about animal research and how that ought to figure into the equation from the animal ethicist, but this is now taken as standard practice. That research protocols should be reviewed by an independent committee. How independent these committees, of course you know what I'm talking about, the IRBs are, is something we could question, but they're certainly more independent than being the investigator herself or himself. That was an established principle or conclusion. Um, that informed consent of participants had to be part of the process. And, by, and now we're talking about informed consent, not just consent, yes, I'll be part of it, but informed consent, which we'll get to in a few minutes, and what, what involves, what constitutes informed, we want to ask. And then certainly that the risk should not exceed the benefits. It shouldn't be the case that this is interesting for knowledge sake, but what are the benefits? If there are risks, there need to be benefits and they need to be balanced. Oops. Okay. That, uh, saying one more thing about the Helsinki Code, um, that did not become part of US law other 
nations took Helsinki and, and made it part of the regulatory schema of their own nations. The United States, in typical fashion, did not take some other country's code or some other organization's code and make it their own. That's very standard for the United States. Instead, they had parallel discussions going on, really inspired by Helsinki, and many of the principles were incorporated into U.S. practice. But where we really start getting codified regulations happens when we think about the Belmont Report and that process. Now, in 1979, a report was issued that lays out the basic principles of human subjects research. We're going to see that it becomes part of U.S. regulation, actually not till 1991, but it's all based on the Belmont Report. It's called the Belmont Report because of the name of the conference center was Belmont. One of the things that's interesting about the Belmont Report, and I'm going to give you some of the, the, the four main principles, but it was, it was written by a researcher named Thomas Beecham. And at the time, he was just a researcher, not the founding father of American bioethics, or one of the founding fathers as we know him today. He was a staffer. He was not part of the commission that was appointed to think through these ideas. But at the time, he was writing a book, the book, practically the tour of bioethics, the principles of biomedical ethics, with Jim Childress, with James Childress. They were both at Georgetown at the time, and this book had begun to be written. It was already underway. So folks often think that Beecham took the principles of biomedical ethics and brought it to the Belmont Report as if he were actually part of the commission, or they think that as part of the commission, what came out of the Belmont Report became the principles of biomedical ethics. In fact, it was a dialectic, and he was really the writer of the Belmont Report, but he was not part of the actual commission, and they were written at the same time. Though it turns out to be the case that principles of biomedical ethics got published first. But that's just an artifact of the publication process and who had to approve what in order for these various things to get published. Okay, the Belmont Report ends up then using the four principles of bioethics that have become to be known as the Georgetown mantra. The mantra, because Beecham and Childress were at Georgetown at the time. So I'm playing a little fast and loose with history here to say that the Belmont Report used the Georgetown mantra when the, there was no mantra at the time the Belmont Report was written. And yet, you probably know these principles in this particular order because it's been mantrified. In fact, if you have any relationship to the field of bioethics, if you have any familiarity with the field of bioethics, you could probably close your eyes and recite this series of principles, not only getting the four right, but getting them in the order. It's got an, almost a chant-like quality to it, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice. And I've given you these four principles here with this mini definition. But now I want to turn to that. I've got the same thing on this slide. But now I have the kind of concerns or what we might call moral considerations listed under each principle. So you can see how in the report what got fleshed out from those principles. Another caveat here, I've used the mantra, the four principles. In the actual Belmont report, they decided that there were only three, Beecham and Childress put four principles into their work. And the reason is simply that beneficence and non-maleficence are um, complementary ideas and, in fact, may not need to be distinguished. Beecham and Childress thought they did need to be, so that beneficence, the idea of helping others, they thought should be distinguished from the active doing of harm and the prohibition against doing harm. In the Belmont Report, both ideas are articulated under beneficence, but it's a small change. I kept them separate as well because now you can see the elements of human subjects research that go underneath each principle. So let's look at them for just a second. So under autonomy, which you could loosely define as respect for persons, we get the concern about informed consent and about the competence of research subjects. Because, of course, in, in many research protocols, you are 
presumably dealing with competent subjects, subjects who have the capacity to decide about their own participation. Sometimes you may not know that you have a subject who does not have competence to say yes or no to a particular protocol. But there are protocols that are designed specifically to engage individuals who are surely not competent. For example, protocols that deal with advanced dementia or some other type of mental illness, not not the kind of in mental illness that doesn't affect capacity, but the kind of mental illness that might. For example, um, research on individuals who are in a highly psychotic episode or who, who really are not in, in touch with reality as we define it. So we are still hoping to do research to help create therapies or at least an understanding of those disease processes, but the competence becomes an issue and what to do to protect those subjects becomes very important. So under autonomy. Under beneficence, the idea of helping others or contributing to the human good, and this is where we get the concern, which dovetails on the last one, of protecting vulnerable subjects. Some subjects that need protection are incompetent by their mental status. Some, though, are vulnerable by, uh, we call them incompetent, but that's simply by the the category that these individuals find themselves in. For example, maybe their children. So if you're a child, you have not reached the age when you can actually give consent, and therefore you're incompetent in quite a different way than if you have severe dementia, or perhaps you have, you're unconscious. So there might be research protocols that, in, that, that have some type of work being done on individuals who are not conscious, who are um, perhaps in a, a comatose or um, other states like that. And there are other vulnerable categories like pregnancy because of the dual role of the, the woman as uh, pregnant herself, but then carrying another um, entity. So that um, is thought to require extra protections. And um, then something we'll talk about in a few minutes, prisoners who may very well be competent in terms of what they understand, but are in such a compromised and vulnerable position by where they find themselves that they need those added regulations. So that's what we find under beneficence. Under non-maleficence, do no harm. We will think in, in uh, this lecture about undue inducements. Um, I'm just adding here that you might also want to consider risk reduction to try to minimize the harms that are coming to subjects. And then under justice, what I could define as the ec equitable distribution of resource or burdens, thinking about, for example, um, the distribution of burden thinking about questions like broad subjects participation, that is, trying to create a very vast uh, grouping for, um, for participation in research, not always concentrating that research, especially voluntary and compensated research, in populations that might have um, who, that might, might be the uh, working class or the lower socioeconomic classes or uh, the underclass. A lot of the populations that tend to volunteer for paid research, at least under on normal um, controls. So we want to think about trying to spread out the burden of reaching, uh, of, 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 of uh, having the burden be on the backs of a much larger group, a more representative group in the society rather than just certain segments. And then questions of fair compensation for time and effort and suffering that does not slip into undue inducement. So those are the set of concerns. I'll talk about only a couple of those concepts in a few minutes. So then wrapping up the history of human subjects research, the Belmont Report gets translated in, in 1981 into a set of regulations from the Department of Health and Human Services it takes 10 years to get formally adopted as the wheels of the bureaucracy move at the pace that they do. At, by 1991, it, this set of regulations was adopted by 10 agencies and was nicknamed the Common Rule. And now there are 17 agencies. Almost every federal agency uses the Common Rule. And let's get just some of the requirements that are part of it. This common rule, um, I, I think I assigned it. So you have the little sections, they're all numbered and they lay out quite specifically what kind of, of protections and regulations there need to be. For example, for compliance, 
for um, documenting informed consent, for IRBs, their existence, and how they should operate, and how they should function, and how they should keep records, and then these additional protections for the groups that we talked about, pregnant women, prisoners, and children. Okay, we're going to take questions at the end, so I'm just going to move right on to the concepts. Okay, so let's look at informed consent. Three elements primarily for informed consent, disclosure, comprehension, and voluntariness. And each of these elements of informed consent are actually what you might call, might, might refer to as problematized, meaning not straightforward, not easy to achieve, even when you are trying very hard to make sure that you are um, getting full disclosure, that you do have full comprehension, that you have a complete voluntariness in the consent, it is still not easy to achieve these three things. So let's think about each one of these and why they're not so straightforward as they might seem. Let's talk about disclosure. You can't simply do a brain dump of what the, you as the PI want your subjects to understand. Um, you couldn't possibly, of course, but even trying to get out the purpose and the risks and the possible benefits and for the subject herself, but also for the disease group of which she may be a part of or for society in general or the adverse events, the side effects, even wanting to get all of that into a consent form, it's still very difficult to, to know how to phrase the various purposes, how in depth in the science you need to go in order to make it transparent what you're trying to do, how, what, what kind of risks you ought to name and in, with what type of emphasis. Um, you, you'll try to list everything there is, but how are you going to package it, not so that you can get folks to consent, so that you could convey to your subjects where the worry really lies, so that you, you might want to tell them about a one in a 10,000 chance, but you want them to understand that it really is a risk of that magnitude as opposed to something where there's a one in two risk, let's say, of nausea, but there's only a one in 10,000 risk of an infection. But you need to, of course, convey that as well, because just to list risks doesn't actually help the person reading the form or in a dialogue with you about the about the protocol understand what she's actually getting into and you wouldn't want her to think that that an infection rate if it's one in 10,000 or nausea in 50 percent is actually the same thing so it becomes it's really quite complicated even laying out the probabilities uh, or or where the worry ought to lie or how severe ought oh, might some of these effects be and then the adverse events. How do, you, how do you talk about it? How far back do you go? When we talk about the Gelsinger study, famous study that happened here at Penn, one of the adverse events that happened in the animal studies was left out. But left out in what sense? It was not the same protocol in, in an essential way that, that created this adverse event. So are you to know that that's something that must be in, something that is really in quite a different study with quite a different element? So again, disclosing sounds easy because you're all honest and you want to fully disclose. But there are still human choices that get made and they get made by a particular perspective. And it's very hard to understand if your perspective would be like any other PI's perspective and would it be the perspective of what the subject would want to hear. So that's the problem. This is just a, a quick understanding of why disclosure is not easy. But then you have the comprehension side. That's the side of the subject getting the information in the direction of, of understanding. What am I getting from this very large consent form? So while you're trying to articulate a very lengthy, uh, you're trying to articulate as full as you possibly can, what needs to be known, this thing is getting lengthier and lengthier, and I'm getting more and more bored and overwhelmed with the prospect of it, especially when you think about how many of these consent forms are written at the 10th grade level, whereas the median reading level in the U.S. is 6th grade. So many, uh, much of it is going over many of the, you know, the heads of many of the subjects, and yet you're doing your best to disclose, and I'm trying to comprehend, and so there is already going to be a disjunct between the PhD MD writer and then the subject 
who's trying to grapple with all of these difficulties, and then grapple with all of the complexities in the protocol already with the frame or the filter of my own reasons for coming into the study, whether that be perhaps that I need the compensation, so maybe I am doing it because it is in some way economically important for me, or maybe I'm in a disease group, so I have a kind of altruistic motive for, and I want to see this research succeed. That, I think, was one of the things going on in Jesse Gelsinger, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail if I'm referencing something you're not familiar with. Or I am a member of the group myself and I am hoping to have some type of benefit directly now in this study or soon, in, in, directly later when the study has evolved and has become some type of therapy. So I have a filter through which I'm reading this and that filter might, might entail hope or desperation or passion for what you're doing. So comprehension is not easy either. And then we come to voluntariness. There's the problem of undue inducement. I'll talk about that in just one minute. But let's talk about coercion, both overt and subtle. Overt coercion is the type of coercion we had in the research protocols that went on in World War II, for example. We're hoping that there isn't so much overt coercion anymore, but there is certainly subtle coercion. For example, where you don't want to turn down the, especially let's say you, there's an MD PI and the MD happens to be your treating MD. So you don't want to turn down the PI who happens to be your clinician. Not just because you don't want to get good, you don't want to get bad care if you're the person who rejected my study, but because you want to please that person. You, you have a relationship and that relationship is important to you and you, you want to be able to offer this gift, but maybe you're not so sure that you want to participate. So there can be subtle types of coercion of that kind of, of order. Maybe it isn't even the MDPI who's your treating clinician, maybe it's that that person is part of a team, it's, it's that person's department, or even it's that person's hospital. So many types of subtle coercion that can impact voluntariness. Okay, so let's talk about undue inducement, the problem of voluntariness, where the kind of compensation that I'm getting is not just an inducement. We all have to have a kind of inducement or we don't do it. Um, but the question is, how do we make sure that it's not an undue inducement? Let's think about inducement in general. Some of us don't need to be induced at all to participate in a research protocol. And whenever I give a lecture like this, especially if I have a large group, I ask how many people, and I won't ask you to raise your hand today because you're not on film, but you think about this question, how many people have volunteered for a research protocol and had absolutely no inducement except altruism, just the conviction or the feeling in their heart of hearts that this was the right thing to do. And um, usually there's very few people who have actually, in percentage, who have volunteered for a research protocol and, and hats off to you. But most people needed an inducement. Either it was part of Psych 101, so you couldn't get out of the class. That's a kind of inducement. You have to have it as a grade. Or perhaps you were getting a kind of compensation. Or perhaps you were motivated by the disease you're part of, the, the disease you have, and a motivation to have some type, some type of therapy for that disease. But most of us get compensated in, a, in some way. And that's why we're induced. But let's look at a couple of statements of what turns inducement into undue inducement, where inducement crosses the line. Let's look at the National Commission in 79. Undue influence occurs through an offer of excessive, unwarranted, inappropriate or improper reward or other overture in order to obtain compliance. Um, amplifying this, um, Scott Halpern in 2004, same theme thinking mostly about money, monetary inducements may be undue if they alter the patient's decision-making processes such that they do not appropriately consider the risks of participating. And I'll give you one more and then we'll discuss them for a second. An undue inducement defined as an offer one could not refuse, that's essentially coercive. Undue inducements may be troublesome because the offers that, that are too attractive may blind prospective subjects to the risks or impair their ability to exercise proper judgment, and they may prompt subjects to lie or conceal information that, if known, would disqualify them from enrolling. So 
all three of these quotes get at the same idea, but let's look at this quote and, and think about the two components of, of this concern. First, it may blind your participants to a, an accurate assessment of the risks and benefits. There's a wonderful paper from Ruth Macklin where she goes through four studies, all of which she considers to be undue inducement in, in the history of, of human subjects research. And one of them is a gonorrhea study where they are actually going to give gonorrhea to the subject participants. They're going to inject them with gonorrhea. And at the time, it's worth a certain amount, but in today's dollars, it would be between three and $5,000. So when I, I, we want to think about what kind of, two questions, what kind of compensation would induce you to allow someone to inject you with gonorrhea most of you are going to say absolutely none, right? And then the second question, what type of circumstance must you find yourself in such that there would be a, a price tag and you would allow yourself to be injected with gonorrhea? Mm -hmm. And I think right there, by the fact that most of us, no matter, uh, many of you are graduate students, so you're certainly not flush, and yet even $5,000 would not be enough. And the fact that I would have to keep upping the price tag shows you that, th that it, it really is the kind of study that has so much risk, is such an assault in terms of its invasiveness and what, what it presents to your body that you can't imagine accepting it. And yet, men did enroll in this study. And that the idea here is that it's so attractive to a particular group, a group that, for example, has such economic deprivation and it has such a desperate, uh, people who find themselves in such a desperate situation that you um, might be tempted to do something like this to your own body. One of the answers that Macklin, a bioethicist, gives in this paper is that if you couldn't get individuals from many class brackets, from a wide range of economic circumstances to enroll in the study, you can be pretty sure that you have an undue inducement. You've got a study that, it, that you can't, that, that is difficult to, um, to justify in terms of bioethics. And by looking at graduate students who don't make a lot of money and yet not being able to entice them with $5,000, that should be a tip off, I think, right there that we've got a problematic study. But then think about the second one, that the offer seems so good that you can't refuse it. Um, it, it I mean, sorry, that you would lie to get into it because you so desperately want to get into it. And she gives us the example of a study of sleep deprivation and the price tag is, the, the compensation is so significant. She goes through this example of a, of a woman with anorexia who, do, who lies about having this condition and dies of, a, of heart failure during this, this particular study, um, saying that, that if the compensation is so high that your circumstance is in, and maybe the risk wasn't that high, but it just involved many days and, and a great you know, amount of, of putting out of time or I, I'm forgetting the details of the study. It wasn't particularly risky, but it was so attractive to someone who, not because she had anorexia, but because of her economic circumstance, that she lied about the kind of condition, underlying condition she had. That too, folks have argued, would, would present an undue inducement. Of course, what you notice in the prior slide is that if it's excessive, unwarranted, or inappropriate or improper reward, but what you don't see is a list of what those things would actually be. So it's still left in the eyes of the PI what would constitute these, this level of, of improper or excessive. And again, we bring in Macklin's um, suggestion that if you can't get participation from a larger group than just folks with a certain type of economic deprivation, then you probably have something wrong in your recruitment or in the, in the compensation. Okay, let's look at the therapeutic misconception. <coughs> this, will do, this is a very easy concept. We won't spend much time here. This is the idea that, uh, what, that patients can misunderstand that the purpose of a trial is research and not therapy. That's why folks are called subjects and not patients. 
and and yet it's very easy for her patients to or subjects to misunderstand that the primary purpose is knowledge or future therapy but this itself is not therapy and they the subjects can make their decisions about whether or not to participate based on this false hope um, a very an ever present problem especially in chemotherapy trials or other trials where they look like therapy um, in their structure, as opposed to questionnaires or other types of research, EKGs, where you couldn't misunderstand so easily that you're actually getting a therapy, but especially drug trials, this is a, a big problem. And then finally, on the human subjects research, conflict of interest. We hear a lot about it. The definition I'm going to use is a situation in which financial or other personal considerations have the potential to compromise or bias professional judgment or objectivity from the Responsible con Conduct of Research organization looking at two types, the intangible, that is academic scholarship, prestige, advancement, and then quite tangible financial relationships. We probably hear more about the second, and yet I'm going to take you through four studies, very um, egregious problems in the history of human subjects research, two that were intangible and two that were tangible, mixed I think in the, in the last two. But um, Tuskegee, which you know about, is the uh, syphilis study, and that was its actual title, I've just quoted the, the actual title from the study. The um, study was of syphilis and how syphilis takes its natural course. The problem was that not long after the study started, penicillin was understood to actually be curative for syphilis, and yet they let the study run on. And the idea of the conflict of interest was that this would have, to understand the full course and to understand it across, uh, across all of these decades, would have enabled the research, uh, the PIs, to publish and to have a certain kind of notoriety and, and you know, a certain kind of academic success. With the Willowbrook hepatitis study, it was a, uh, a study in a children's home for children who were um, mostly mentally retarded. Hepatitis of all varieties, of all types, was prevalent at this home. But, and, and actually much of, the, of what we know about hepatitis, a lot of it came from these early studies, especially distinguishing types of hepatitis. But what the researchers decided to do was inject per, um, children as they were going into the home. Um, I can give you details in the discussion section, but they decided to inject them with hepatitis C. And parents allowed this because it was 100% um, uh, transmission rate inside Willowbrook and so they to get gain to gain entrance into this home they allowed their children to be injected with hepatitis C on the view that they were going to get it anyway this also is thought now to be a conflict and many many problems with this study obviously but um, that they wanted to be able to do their research and this was not only a vulnerable population but then to inject them with the benefit of nothing you know no 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 therapeutic offer. On the tangible side, conflict of interest financially with both the Jesse Gelsinger and the Kligman skin studies. Um, the Gelsinger case happened here. Both of them did, actually. Um, that's why I use them. But the Gelsinger case was uh, involved the PI James Wilson who had financial incentives in this gene therapy trial. Um, the, uh, the, the case is that Jesse Gelsinger enrolled in this trial right as soon as he turned 18. It was an OTC deficit disorder trial. The idea was to use a gene uh, through, uh, it, it was actually just a, a, a test of the vector, the cold vector, but um, he died in this study and lots of problems came out, including problems with informed consent. But one of the issues was that Dr. Wilson had stake in the company that was funding the trial. With Kligman, the, um, the issue was a prisoner experiment uh, and the protection of vulnerable subjects, but it turned out that Kligman also had financial interests in the development of some of the drugs, and Retin-A was one of them. We can talk again.
leader about this, but I know that we're getting a little bit short on time, though this next section will be much shorter. So that just is a broad overview of the history of human subjects research and some of the main concepts. Now thinking about animal research, I want to do two things. I want to look at the regulatory scheme that exists, primarily the institutional um, review boards, the um, IACOX. I want to talk about what they can do and what they don't do, and then talk very briefly about the main thoughts in animal ethics which seem to be quite uh, mismatched to what's happening in animal research, not a good connection between animal ethics and the way that animal research is happening, and uh, that will reflect back on where IACOX are. So institutional animal care and use committees are required at any institution that or organization that uses animals in research, and they are very local in the way that they, what the content is of the specific IACOC. And I'm going to give you some examples of pens. They, uh, the IACOC regulates everything having to do with the use of animals, and they review the protocol to make sure that the PIs, the, the research, is conforming with the institution's own standard, but it very much is the institution's own standard that governs. So unlike at the federal level, uh, unlike human subjects research, which is governed federally and is very standardized, animal research is, is required to have a regulatory schema at the local institution, but it differs very widely. So if you go to IACOC.com, for example, you can look at all of the universities and click on them for their specific regulations, but they will not be uh, identical, though there will be some overlap. In some cases, there'll be significant overlap. So I've given you an, an example here. Um, this will be on the web. You can look at it, and you can go to the pen regulations. But this, for example, is the regulations for anesthetics, for rodents. The, I've also given you a little example here of restraints and the kind of protocol for restraining animals and under what circumstances animals can be restrained. But what you don't have in IACOX is the question of whether and to what extent animal research ought to go on at all. That is, IACOX assume that animal research is morally justifiable, and now what we need to think about is how to do it in the best possible way. It is mostly a regulatory schema that tries to control pain and suffering. It's much weaker when it comes to meeting non-physical needs of animals, what is sometimes referred to as enrichment. It doesn't consider at all in some cases or only minimally in others the conditions that create species-specific thriving. I'll give you a quick example. Pigs are known to be very social animals. They are a highly intelligent species. They have um, a great number of requirements for their the thriving of individual pigs, uh, like social interaction, rooting, uh, the um, opportunity for the uh, you, uh, um, exhibiting it or, or participating in inquisitive behavior, and yet very few research, very little research that utilizes pigs has any kind of enrichment. Uh, one thing you might want to ask about when we think about research is what ways do we use those same species and do we protect their species specific interest in those other arenas of use? So when you think about pigs in research, you will naturally ask about pigs on the plate. And of course, I'm here to tell you that there's very little concern about the species specific thriving of pigs in factory farming either. Does that make research no worse? Or is that does that help to justify it? I'm not sure. But I'm just laying that out, that comparatives when we do animal ethics is very important because if we're going to demand something of one arena of human use of animals, then we ought to understand why are we setting the bar differently in that arena than in any other arena. There might be good reasons why medical and scientific research ought to be better than factory farming, but we'd certainly want to articulate why. So I'm going to do three very quick things here in animal ethics. I'm going to talk about the consequentialist account. I'm going to talk specifically about Peter Singer. I'm going to talk about the animal rights account, which is a kind of deontological account articulated best by Tom Regan. And then I'm going to talk about another non-consequentialist account that is not a rights account, David DeGrazia, who's got a sliding scale account. And I want to say at the outset, 
that none of the three of these positions support human subjects research in anywhere near the scope or scale or processes that are used now. So what I'm, what did you say? You mean animal subjects. What did I just say? Human subjects. Oh, thank you. Yeah, these, this has nothing to do with human. But actually, what an interesting Freudian slip. Because these folks think about animals in a way that would, would have animal research really be much more analogous to human subjects research. So while that was, a, uh, that was an error in what I said, it does get to the gut of, of what the problem is. So you have animal research functioning and continuing on over here, and you have theory about what ought to be done in animal research over here, and there is not a meeting of the minds. Whereas in human subjects research, and human subjects research ethics, you actually do have a very nice uh, cooperation and connection that is not true in the arena of animal research at all, as you will see. Let's take a look at Peter Singer's consequentialist account. His book, Animal Liberation, was responsible for massive changes in, uh, in policies and thoughts about animals in Europe. It is uh, I think a source of the animal rights movement, and I'm using animal rights very broadly here, not rights in that deontological sense, but just concern about animals and how to protect them. Peter Singer really can take a great deal of the credit. Whatever you think of his work, he really started the dialogue. I, I find that, that it's easy to, to, to attribute that to him. One of his main uh, principles is that uh, speciesism is wrong, one of, one of his main contentions that a prejudice in favor of your own interests from the species of which you are a member is wrong. He thinks in the consequentialist way we talked about last session that entities have particular interests and any interest that is shared across species has to count the same way and has to be part of that calculus of the overall good. Of course, animals do have interests. They suffer, they feel pain, so they have to get into the equation. So there, if, but when we think about animals and the way in which they need to count as we try to balance the overall well-being and try to maximize the greatest good for the greatest number, we need to think about the various interests that different species have. So for example, if I have an interest in avoiding pain, but I also have an interest in, in, in having my future be good, so I have a fear of the future interest if something dreadful is being proposed, but an animal only has avoid pain interests, then I have two interests and that animal has only one. So I have an unlike interest that may trump the like interest. So for example, my concern about dying from cancer has to be part of the equation, whereas the pain that I am experiencing because I have a disease and the, the pain that the animal is experiencing because the animal is participating in a research protocol to try to cure that disease gives me an edge in that equation. So benefits of one set of interests can sometimes outweigh other interests. This is why someone like Peter Singer will not rule out animal research. He will just question how often, on balance, we really are getting enough benefit for the buck. How are we really getting enough benefit for the pain that we're causing to those millions of mice? That's very different from Tom Regan's account. The bottom line of Tom Regan's animal rights account, it truly is a rights account, is that you should not be doing animal research unless you're treating animals the way that you're treating any other vulnerable human population like prisoners or children. His view is that there are moral agents and there are moral patients. Agents are people like us. They are able to, to employ impartial concepts to act morally. That's the way deontologists think that morality justifies human beings having the high lofty status, the infinite worth that we think human beings have. Animals are not moral agents, at least to our ability right now of understanding what kinds of actions they're capable of or what kind of cognition. They appear to be moral patients. They have desires and beliefs, but they can't do what's right or wrong. They can act instinctually, but they cannot act morally. So they are not moral agents. On the other hand, when you think about many human beings and at categories of humans like infants or young children or individuals in a persistent vegetative state or those with dementia, 
They're also not able to employ impartial principles, and yet they count deontologically as those that matter, those that must be protected for their value. So Tom Regan says, really, when you think about the smartest animals, they are way more together and have more going on than anyone in a PVS state for sure, but even infants. So they really need to be thought of as moral patients. And for, I won't give you everything here there, that's going to be on the website and you can take a look at it, but let's look at the postulate of inherent value. He's going to argue that whether you're an agent or a patient, you have a distinctive type of value regardless of how many interests you have and regardless of, of how you're able to express those interests or how much you have going on. Once you're in the category of agent or patient, you have a kind of value that cannot have your interest traded off to with any other type of entity. That distinguishes this position radically from the consequentialist. A consequentialist will look at an entity and say, you've got five out of the possible 15 interests, so you get five units, let's say, in a particular equation. That means you count more than an entity that have, would have two interests, but you count less than someone that might have 15 interests. And your interests could be traded off among these various entities. But in this dis dichotomous category of you either count or you don't, you're either a moral agent patient or you're not. You count absolutely. And so you have to be protected in just the way every other member of the agent patient population gets counted. And that means if animals are part of that set, they count in just the same exact way that human beings count, especially vulnerable. In fact, they get more protection because they cannot give consent. They're not competent. So animals start to count in the way that infants do, a very radical position indeed that really outlaws just about all animal research except that research that would cause no harm that or that would cause it would would create great benefit for animals the way that he decides who gets into the category of agent patient is the criteria he calls the subject of a life and um, I'll leave that to you to read on the web. But that lays out who is a subject of a life, and it's pretty minimal. If, if you have any kind of perception or memory, if you um, have the same identity over time, if you have any sense of welfare, and this would probably be a, a wonderful subject for this group, very interested in psychology and neuroscience to think about, but this is a minimal criteria indeed. Many entities get into this category of moral patient. What does it mean? You can't be in a research protocol without your consent unless you are treated in the way that others who cannot consent are able to participate. And I'm going to give you here the three criteria for children. Either it's for their own benefit, then you can use children. It is only minimal risk, and, and minimal is defined by the common rule very minimally, like a blood draw, something incredibly minimal or some kind of cognitive study where there'd be no impact at all, or only a minor increase over minimal risk, but it would benefit the disease group. So if it's arthritic dogs, and this is something that would require a little bit more invasiveness than a blood draw, okay if this is a dog that has arthritis. That's the way it's thought of. If you're a child with juvenile diabetes, and this is going to be a little bit more invasive than a blood draw, but it could benefit others, and maybe you down the line, who have juvenile diabetes, fine. That's how radical Regan's view is, and then we get degrasia. I don't know how far degrasia is going to be able to get in, in the direction of research as it's going on now. He will probably allow more research than either Singer, and certainly anything would be more than Regan, but his view is that animals could have equal consideration for equal interests and still have unequal moral status, but that would end up allowing some types of research on certain types of animals and probably not much research on other types. So he will treat like interests alike, give the same weight to the same interests, but think about a sliding scale of moral status and yet take very seriously that there really are differences in moral status as opposed to the lumping everybody in the everybody, you know, every entity into the moral patient agent category. So he's going to think about this sliding scale and he's going to give us in one of his papers 10 points of agreement and I'll be wrapping it up with that 10 points. 
here you go. 10 points. See how far we get in, if you think of the vast array of research you are either doing or you, are, you have been exposed to or you know about, how much of animal research would actually meet these 10 points of agreement or how much agreement do we actually get with these 10 points? I think we get very little, actually. It, it, it allows some research. It doesn't allow anywhere near what we're doing and, and for the reasons we're doing it. So points of possible agreement. Yes, the use of animals in research raises questions. I think we'll all sign on to that. Sentient animals deserve some type of protection. IACOX have already mandated that that's so. Many animals are capable of experiencing pain, distress, and suffering. Yes, of course, animal researchers believe that. They just think that that has to be trumped sometimes for the greater human good. Animals' quality of life deserves to be protected. I'm not sure he can get agreement on that because much of animal research disturbs animals' quality of life unless you think that quality of life boils down to nothing but excruciating pain. Because IACOX do take care of that. Anesthetics are required. But there must be more to quality of life from some, certain species than just that. Humane care of highly social animals requires access to members of that species. That is not done in, 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 very, in many labs across the United States. I'd go so far as to say very few, very few actually do that. Non-human primates probably get the best treatment, but pigs have a lot going on too, and there's very little going on for them in terms of access to their co-specifics. Co very strong protections should be in place for certain species. I think that people might agree with that, but how strong are, is very strong. Animals should not be used when there is an alternative. Everyone signs on to that, but it's in the eyes of the beholder whether there's an alternative. In Europe, for example, many protocols are thought to have alternatives that in the U.S. we don't think have any alternatives. The Europeans are far more conservative in their use of animals. And with their replace, refine, reduce motto, they really do re uh, replace models that are not, uh, do not engage animals far more readily than we do. Number eight. Protecting human health is an important goal. We're all going to go thumbs up on that, but it doesn't get us anywhere. Number nine, there are some morally important differences between humans and animals. Yes, I think people will grant that. That's something that Regan will not grant, that Singer will. And some animal research is justified. Yes, we'll all sign on to that, but um, how much is justified is where we're going to have the point of disagreement, I think. So there, we actually have it, I think, in a nutshell. We ran by it very quickly, and, and we'll take questions.